Welcome, investigator. Evil is on the rise. Crime is escalating. Our mission is to eliminate the crime by exposing evil, examine why it manifests, and highlight the brave souls that confront it every day. Join us as we work together to bring justice to every victim. Welcome to All Things Crime. Here's your host, Jared Bradley. Hey, everybody. It's Jared. Welcome back to another episode of All Things Crime. I got my man, Tom Myers, with me. And there's another case that we wanted to talk about. And this is one of those that it's it's kind of run of the mill, but at the same time, it's a head scratcher because if you think about a family member and it doesn't matter if it's a child, a spouse, a sister, you know, a father, whatever, if somebody in your extended family or even a friend, somebody that you're relatively close to didn't, you know, just disappeared, how long would it take before you would start saying, Hey, where is so-and-so? Well, that's, that's kind of what's happened with, um, this victim, Jean, and I want to say Gina Burris. She's out of, uh, Sarasota, Florida, and they just identified her. She disappeared in 2007. So, but the family never reported her missing. And, and to me, it's just like, what? Tom, what do you? What do you think? I, I mean, how how is it that nobody, including the son, w- would never mention anything that, like the son, he, he the last picture that I saw in all the news broadcasts, it, it looks like he was I don't know eight, maybe ten, and you know all, all of a sudden his mom disappears and he just, I mean, I'm trying to think of what what kind of. Um, as a eight, even an eight year old, what kind of lies I would have to be told from my father about my mom that wouldn't make me mention it to anybody. Any ideas? Yeah. So the power of denial, especially a little guy who's eight or 10 years old and uh, he doesn't want to even consider, you know, his whole world is his family. And dad probably told her mom walked out on us and that's it. We're, we're together. It's my guess is probably what they did. And, and you very impressionable young man. So he would have just run with that. And so that kind of eliminates him from the whole process. Uh, of course, everything's pointing to James Burris as being the murderer in this, the killer is in his comfort zone. He worked right there at the, uh, auto body shop and where they had done the, had recovered the remains back in, back in, uh, 07, I believe. And so. All, all things point to him. So those two are out of the equation. Extended family, we don't know, but we do know from contemporaneous reports now coming out is that a, I believe an aunt and uncle had talked to uh, press recently about her missing and they're up in Maryland. So they have no local connections there. And um, going back to that time period, uh, it's just the internet was not as, as uh, robust as it is now. So, you know, you have that um, dribbling effect where it's just tapered off and they just thought, you know, she could have been a bohemic type person that just is prone to going off and living by herself. And they, he may not, and probably did not maintain any contact with them. And it's only extended family. And so that's just a recipe for falling through the cracks. You know, that, that's my guess on it, Jared, because, um, you know, they're, they're getting caught up real, really quickly now on this as, as the story is breaking. Yeah. Yeah. I totally agree. That's, it's one of those that, um, looking at it through the lens that we have. And, and th- this is a, this is something that, I, I think a lot of us do today and, and, you know, the, the first, when I first started out, I, I mean, part of that, I was being facetious, but at the same time, <laughs> at the same time, it's kind of like, well, we, we have to look at, at this through the lens of 2007. And you think about Facebook wasn't even really going back then. I mean, imagine the world without, you know, some of these social media platforms now. And so, that's kind of where we were and genealogical DNA, uh, wasn't, uh, even, uh, uh, on the scene. 11 years away. Yeah. Yeah. I was years still away. years away. And this is something that's really important that I think all, all of our listeners need to understand is the current or the, the database b- prior to genealogy is called, it, it's the portion of the DNA pro uh, the DNA strand that they look at is called an STR. And it's a, it stands for short tandem repeat. So it's, it's places on your DNA strand 
that repeat over and over and over and over. But the key is they're exclusive to you. Now, they're awesome when you have a good, a good STR profile from some kind of a surface or your clothing or something like that. And then, and this is key, you have to have something to compare it to. And it's a known sample, such as a buckle swab, or, you know, when you, you see in the, on the TV shows and all the time where they'll take a, a like a Q-tip and rub it on the inside of your mouth. And that is a known as a sole source, a uh, buckle, you know, um, a single contributor where they absolutely know where that came from. And in fact, every time I go in and train in a crime lab, I have to do that because they have to have my profile on, on file so that if, if for some reason my DNA ever shows up anywhere, they can eliminate me as a suspect and keyword eliminate me as a suspect because, you know, I don't ever do anything wrong and I, I would, I would never be a suspect of anything. Right, Tom? Absolutely. Range, range of creed. Yep. Yeah. Appreciate you backing me up, man. Never screw your buddy, yeah. right? Right. <laughs> and the important thing, what you're saying right here is in that time period, they probably, I'm going to surmise, and as this thing unravels and we hear the story unravel on the press and everything else, she probably didn't have any close relatives where the detectives could get to. It's very strained now when you get out from outside of Florida and you don't know where this guy's living and who her relatives are. And um, there's also a resourcing thing. It, it, the, the, the trail grows cold when he abruptly left as the press is reporting on that. So, and the recent accounts say that they interviewed him and he wouldn't say anything. So they knew they were onto this person, but there's little else that you can do if they don't have a uh, family member that they can trace back to the DNA at the time. And plus, they're not really able to identify the skeletal remains at the time. That's the big sticking point. So even if they did have it, they couldn't make that match until recently. But um, and then the trail goes cold and then people go into denial and they think, well, if there was something there, the police would have done something on it. So there must not be. And maybe and they want to believe they want to believe that something dreadful didn't happen to their loved one. If that if that extended family is you know had any interest in it at all, but she may not have been close to her family, and you see that a lot with these these homicides that happen, and they didn't even know they didn't even know the person was missing, or you know could have been a murder victim, and it seems to be what the case was here. You know, a, a very tight familial unit, they would have been right on top of this, and they would have been clamoring. But um, it seems like it was very strained, and they had lived in multiple locations: Citrus County, Sarasota, for a couple of years. Frederick, Maryland, Bowie was another, um, Maryland was another address on there. So that's a lot of moving in that time space there when public records started coming online. And by yeah. the way, Facebook barely coming online. It's my space at the time. We didn't have Facebook. So, yeah. yeah. Well, and also from reports, we, we hear that he worked at an auto body shop and, uh, she was unemployed. So they probably had some real financial difficulties. And the, the house that they lived in wasn't, uh, uh, wasn't overly elaborate. So, uh, who knows what, what caused it all, what the motive was behind all of that. But, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of divorces, a lot of, uh, family arguments are caused by finances. So there's probably all sorts of, um, strain that's on there. And, you know, who knows, maybe this, um, this James Burris just snapped and, it sounds like he's he was a, r a real amateur at it, and it's this doesn't sound like anything that he would have put any real thought behind because he buried the body in a shallow grave right behind where he worked. Yeah, that, I mean, it doesn't take a genius to figure out that you know this guy he's probably panicking. He probably um, you know in a in a rage or something, you know, murdered his wife and then realized what he did, and he's like, oh crap. I, I've, I've got to do something. I've got to do it really fast. I, I don't have time to think this through. I've just got to, you know, hurry up and, and get rid of her body. And so, yeah, it, it doesn't surprise me that, um, uh, I, I, th I think as more details come out, uh, it's going to be fairly obvious, you know, exactly what happened. I'm taking a look and my eyes are off the screen for a moment over here. I'm taking a look at when the shallow grave is what they have. So they don't have a the exact listing of this three foot hole, the three foot diameter hole that she was buried inside of. So somebody stumbled up on this somehow. And in the shallow grave, like he speak, spoke to the amateur nature of that other versus there being a pro murderer. But anyway, she was discovered. She was discovered there. So just waiting to be discovered all this time 
over the DNA, which I guess brings us to point number two on the DNA processes now versus 2007 when this, when she was discovered. You know, I mean, we know DNA was in, I guess, comparatively speaking to Golden State Killer, GSK, and GEDmatch and genetic investigative genealogy, that becomes the golden age if you want to set that. And so we're, we're five years beyond that now, but there's really the, the before and the after. So this is significantly before that. And then maybe stepping back another step, the, the trail goes cold. There's not much, you, when the guy leaves the area, there's not much more you can do unless the forensics boils out something that you're able to get uh, results on. And then that this is, he's already a known commodity. He's out there. So he's going to be on the list. But in between that, you have to put active homicides where those leads are going to dry up really quickly. And those have to be sent to DNA Labs International, for example, who's cited in the story, great lab, and they um, did the work on this. But that's there's a cost to the department to do that. And you want to put, you want to prioritize those with viable cases that are out there. So it's time that come, the time had come to, to resolve this one. Yeah. Well, and the, the genealogical DNA, which looks at a, a totally different part of the DNA strand, by the way, that is, yeah, it, it, it started coming out about five years ago, but it's up until maybe a year, year and a half, maybe even two years, it really hasn't been perfected. And it's just now, I mean, literally now, reaching the point where agencies have enough confidence in it. They're actually putting resources toward it where they're saying, Hey, this is, this is proven enough. It's beyond just the, uh, the initial stages. And so sending, sending, you know, DNA and evidence to a lab that has like the Verigen system where it's looking at the SNP and the genealogical side and sending evidence to them specifically for uh, developing a, a genealogical tree, which is going to narrow down the number of people that it could possibly be. And so it's not as precise as the STR, especially if it has something to compare it to, but by developing a, a family tree, then it eliminates, and, and that's exactly what happened with a GSK. And, and if you guys go back to those, the episodes that are coming out right now, you can you can tell that genealogy is is helping solve a lot of cases, and it's so interesting the way that these uh, you know law enforcement is is adapting to this new tool, and just like they they are adapting also to the MVAC and being able to collect more DNA on the you know from the evidence and things like that, but being able to to develop a genealogy tree. And being able to narrow down the number of suspects and then finalizing that for trial purposes uh, on the STR side. That's, it's just fantastic, all this technology that's coming out. Yeah. I uh, do some historic research and writing on historic forensics. So I equate this to the evolution of fingerprints and the gangsters of 34 and the 1930s coming out of prohibition. That was what was getting these guys uh, all the time. And so they became very adept at trying to conceal their fingerprints and things like that. But everybody was was uh, hooked on fingerprints probably for the next 50 years. And that was the the weapon of choice to to identify people. And of course, it still is. It still is a, a great weapon. But it's an exciting time for us forensic types to be into this and doing all of this is uh, so aptly, aptly, aptly put that it's genetic fingerprinting that's out there on this. And then second part I was going to say to this is, but the genetic investigative genealogy, they can go out to about a third cousin. Most of us don't even know who our third cousins might be out there. That when, so when, and, and that has to be somebody who's contributed something to one of the major DNA servers, Ancestry, uh, one of those, GEDmatch or something. And they have to contribute. Somebody in that entire lineage has to contribute to that. And then that mystery begins. So that family tree that you're talking about, they have to start discounting as, as Barbara uh, Ray Venner spoke to us, explained to us very well about how they did that and how they eliminated all these other persons. In this case, they were going after a victim, trying to identify the victim and trying to identify who knows who, who the person was there. But with each generation, you're having the amount of DNA. So they can do an estimation on it, but it's, it's still got to do all of that work to figure who that is. 
And like I said, they may not even know. So that's a lot of ancestry and census data and birth certificates being pulled to try and identify, put this to put this to bed. So this could have been working a good number of years before they really resolved all of this. Oh, hundred percent. Yeah. So it's not like these uh, investigators were just sitting around or just ignoring the case. It's um, technology had to, had to catch up. And now that it has, then a lot of these other questions that we're asking, such as why wouldn't the family uh, report this? Well, it's pretty obvious why the husband didn't report it. And, <laughs> you know, the, the, the adage is it's always the, the husband or the boyfriend when it, whenever stuff like this happens. And that's at least where the investigators start. And it's amazing the percentage of, of the time that that, that adage is, is spot on correct because most of the domestic violence, those kind of things are people that are, are married or have a close relationship. And sadly, that's, uh, that's just kind of the way it is. And in this case, uh, I mean, to me, I, I'm in the high 90s as far as the percentage of, in my mind, of that, yeah, it's the husband that did this. Well, he certainly became an immediate person of interest. We'll call it that way, if not a suspect, whatever the definition means these days, because we know that from the news accounts, they sat down and tried to interview him or talk to him. And then he becomes a shadowy figure. You know, he's in the wind, he's gone. And um, that's another tell, of course, that, that that's out there for us is that you make yourself scarce and you spread that, that those resources to as thin as possible. And you're out of sight and out of mind and nobody's going to stumble upon you. Nobody's going to have a reason to stop you, to, to traffic stop you. And then even 2007, I'm looking at local articles here and this is what I'm looking down for. That's it. That's all it's reporting on this Jane Doe at the time. They sort of know, but they can't say what it is, you know, when she disappears. So, you know, they're somewhat onto her and, um, but they were unable to make that connection until recently. And then you want to be accurate. You want to be right on that before you move it. Yeah. And then if you release that information, it's even worse because the guy flees the country. He's just gone. That's it. Or goes off the yeah. grid, goes to Alaska or, you know, deep in the woods of any place USA in the center parts. Yeah. And they, it, it's not like police can just start rounding people up and taking a DNA sample from them. So, you know, if, if, if she's not being reported and, nobody is is cooperating then there's very little that the police can actually do so and until the technology catches up and uh they don't need to you know worry about the fourth amendment with um mm. you know illegal searches and seizures so that's um it's it's an interesting case and tragic obviously you know it's um it's always horrible to hear about any of these victims and especially these women and children that are more vulnerable and they, um, they don't deserve to get what they got. But the, the key is that eventually justice will be served. And, you know, every victim deserves justice and every victim's family deserves justice. And anybody that, that could actually do this, like, uh, you know, assuming the husband is, is the one that did, he deserves justice too, just on the other end of it. So, any last thoughts, Tom? I keep going back to that great movie. It's a Korean, Korean uh, language film called Memories of Murder. And it talks about the, it demonstrates so well the tenaciousness of the investigators and how frustrated they are uh, trying to put down and figure out who this killer is in their midst in this uh, small Korean rural village where they're, they're sent to work on this. So I encourage anybody who's got an interest in this kind of true crime genre, and it's, it's based on a true story. It explains that very well. It's a tough film to watch because of um, the, the the tragedy that's going around. But also um, in the film, they're very hands-on. It's a very different culture. So you have to sort of absorb that and re and, and understand the uh, intonation and what's going on in there. And there's three different investigators, how they deal with it. But uh, as I'm looking down here in that same vein, the frustration is a news article on the Jane Doe and um, the police officers here, and this was uh, three years after the event. So they live with this vicarious trauma of not, unable to solve who this um, victim is in the ground over here. So kudos for them for not forgetting on this, for staying the course and putting this one down and uh, you know resolving this. And I expect to hear we're going to have a, a uh, an arrest or uh, they're going to develop that case even more. We're going to get another press release. So that might be a follow-up show to where we connect all the dots on that. And I, I'd look forward to doing that. Yeah, absolutely. 
All right, Tom, he appreciate it. Man, time. a sad case. Gina Burris, Jane Doe for 15 years and now um, homicide victim. So hopefully they, uh, they nail down who, uh, who killed her soon. So, hey, Tom, appreciate it, man. All right. Good job, Sarasota, SO. And yep. uh, till the next one, Jared. All right. Be strong, Good buddy. Job. Thanks for joining us. Your attention today brings us one step closer to exposing and eliminating the evil that brings crime to our communities. Hit subscribe and share this episode. Together, we will bring justice to every victim.